Uh, today I'm going to talk about parameters in Atlas, and this is very much a companion talk to David's talk this morning. And in some ways, these two talks, the one David gave this morning and the one I'm giving here, are, are, are the hardest talks to give in the subject, and it's because of this, this dictionary going back and forth between the Atlas world and the, the traditional world. And um, just during the coffee break, uh, in fact, I, I don't want to embarrass him, but Peter uh, came up to me and asked me some question, and, and it was exactly along these lines. It's, even though we've been thinking about this talk for 15 years, it's still confusing. And uh, a couple of years ago, I remember David asked me some question, and I thought about it for a while, and I got back to him, and, and I, I just I made some mistake, and David said, well, you, you've been living so long in the Atlas world, you don't realize there's any other. And it, it was true, I just, I was so focused on the Atlas way of thinking about things, I'd forgotten about something. So, I'm going to, it's a delicate balance, I don't want to get too buried in the weeds, because you, it's just too hard. On the other hand, we need to cover a certain amount of this stuff so you can make sense of the Atlas output. So I'm trying to strike the right balance here. The upside is that the stuff that David talked about this morning is pretty abstract, and one of the great things about the Atlas software is it makes everything totally concrete. And so if you didn't understand what David was talking about, um, after today and maybe after the afternoon session when we do some examples, uh, it will become more fixed in your mind. Questions before I start. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to do is just quickly go through a couple of slides at the beginning of the talk about inner classes. Um, I talked about this yesterday during the afternoon session, and as a matter of fact, I think I covered it more thoroughly than what's on the slide, so I'm just going to go rather quickly through these. We have the automorphism group of G and the space of inner automorphisms, and the outer automorphism group is, by definition, the quotient. And um, for thinking about these things, it's, it's always helpful to remember that if G is semi-simple, then this outer automorphism group is a subgroup of the automorphism group of the Dinkin diagram, which makes it, cuts it way, way down and makes it uh, comprehensible. Now, it's only a subgroup. It's not, it, it may not be the whole automorphism group. We have this exact sequence, and the beautiful thing is that this canonically splits up to inner automorphism. And I was thinking about this the other day. For an arbitrary group, that seems like a really strong condition. I, I, don't, I think that's very rare for this, 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 this sequence to split. I, I don't know. It seems it's, it's one of the, it really uses a lot of the structure theory of reductive groups. So anyway. Um, and so an inner class, remember, is given by an element, uh, I'm sorry, that's a misprint, that should say out of G sub 2, an outer automorphism. Um, well, maybe I'm using the spring, I forget. Um, oh yeah, so, <coughs> excuse me, uh, an inner class is originally given by an element, an outer automorphism of order 2, but using the splitting, you actually get an automorphism of G of order 2, and it's arranged so that it fixes H and B, and as I said yesterday, it also fixes the, uh, the pinning data, the um, set of X alphas, but that's not going to be important for us here. And I've talked quite a bit about the compact inner class, that's when delta is equal to 1. And here's a, a basic heuristic, well, it's more than a heuristic, it's a fact, but it's a useful fact, which is that um, uh, a, 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 a given theta is in the compact inner class, it can only if the corresponding real group has a compact Cartan subgroup. So, for example, for SOPQ, you can tell all the SO2P2Qs two two are in, in, in the compact number class, and, uh, sorry, all of the SOPQs where either P or Q or both is even, uh, sorry, fixed and even, then all of the SOPQs with P and Q both even are in the compact number class, and the ones where P and Q are both odd is in the other number class. And so that's, that's very helpful. All right, so now this is a little bit new. And, can I ask something? Sure. Okay, like, so, that is this distinguished. Yes. So we always do the calculation of this way, but the compact inner class. But yesterday there was like, you're saying that there's a compact 
Yes. So what, what happens is, I mean, never mind inner classes. There's a if you fix a, 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 a pinning data, um, you get a splitting of this exact sequence. And um, so one. So there's a canonical, essentially a canonical splitting here S, and the inner classes. Are given by deltas in this uh, in this outer automorphism group of order two, but using the splitting, you can identify that with the S of deltas, which are distinguished automorphisms of G. Did I answer the question? And all along, I've been talking about the compact inner class just for convenience, so I didn't have to talk about this extra delta. If you're talking about the compact inner class, um, uh, compact inner class is when delta is equal to one, delta is equal to one, and you can pretty much ignore it. And um, what I'm saying now is a couple of the, 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 the few extra words that you need to say to make the statements general. All right, so, um, so given delta in the outer automorphism group and a splitting, you can make this semi-direct product. And this means you take, it's a semi-direct product of G with a subgroup of order two, with a, with a group of order two, and the non-trivial element of the group is acting by the automorphism delta. So just to be uh, explicit, delta G is the union of two cosets Delta acts by conjugation by uh, the action delta, and this element delta has square one. Okay, so in the case when when delta is a trivial automorphism, this is simply the direct product, and uh, in that case you can ignore the extension; it doesn't really do anything. But the um, the more subtle case is uh, when. It, when delta is not trivial, and I hadn't I haven't yet stated the st the statement of KGB, and here it is. So it turns out that uh, if you take an element of this extended, so this is called the extended group. If you take an element of the extended group, which is not in the identity component, one one from the other component, take one whose square is central. Conjugation by uh, I, I didn't write it here, but um, Take theta x naught is conjugation by x naught on G. Uh, I mean, this acts by conjugation on the big, on the extended group. But just look at the um, action of, by conjugation of this element on G. That's a Cartan involution, and um, this is in the inner class of delta. And then define k as usual. And I'm going to define this x space. Um, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't write the right thing here, sorry. Um, uh, that's a misprint, let me write it over here. Um, x bracket x naught is the set of x contained in normalizer and in G delta of H such that x is kind of x naught modulo H. That's what it should say. And uh, so this is very similar to the previous definition. The only difference is that this delta right here. Um, besides that, it's, it's, uh, it's the same definition. And then the theorem is the same, that the, uh, uh, if you define k with respect to this x naught, that this space is naturally parameterized as k orbits on g mod b. So the, the moral of the story is, in order to handle the non-compact inner class, you just need this extended group with this extra delta, and that comes along for the ride and causes you endless headaches. All right, and, and, and having said that, um, there's going to be a fair amount of discussion, I think, next week about this quote unquote twisted case. And that is to say that these kind of these outer automorphisms um, crop up more than once, and uh, there are some extremely interesting unsolved problems 
that several people in the room are working on related to twisted stuff. And I'm looking forward to talking about that a bit next week. Okay. Uh, I, I, should, I should say, um, most, many people in the room have heard this anecdote, but 20 years ago when I gave a lecture on this stuff, when we were, when we were, first, when we were first getting results, I stated something, and Birgit Spey was in the audience, and she came up, uh, she came up afterward and said, oh, that's very nice, but can you do the twisted case? <coughs> you can't please everybody. All right. Um, <coughs> okay, so, um, well, I'm going to go kind of quickly through this since I did this yesterday. Um, the SLN, there's an outer automorphism, which is G transpose G inverse, and the, the compact inner class is the group's SUPQ, and the other inner class has the group SLNR in it, and are there any others? Well, we talked about this. Um, if n is even, there's SLN over 2H, which has uh, K as SPN. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out which inner class this goes in. And, and you can solve this exercise by looking at the video from the first day, I think. <laughs> yes? Is that really good or is that Which is the Yeah. Yeah, so this is an inner automorphism. Uh, delta is one, but theta is, is conjugation by this, this inner, it's, it's an inner automorphism. So all the SUPQs, the, the theta is inner, that's the inner class, that's the compact inner class. What's the matter? No, this is holomorphic. There's no, the sigma is anti holomorphic. This is holomorphic. The fixed points of this is GLP plus GLQ, which is a complexified maximal compactor of the UPQ. Oh, okay. Yeah. So here's the SO2NC example. I, I, I said this in words. Uh, the, inner, the compact inner class is the groups SOPQ, where P and Q are even, and also this group SO star. And the other class is the SOPQs for P and Q to God. And these groups all have a compact carton, and these groups don't. Okay, questions before I go on? Yes? Can you go back to slides? Two slides. I, I mean, there's loose print on the slide. I don't know if this helps. So, so from a from a theory, you have a you have an element C that uh, in the extended group is uh, is first in the uh, synthesizer. No, oh, just the center of G. I think that I'm sorry, the center of G. Yes. If there is not a twist, then uh, there there is a capture which comes a strong group form. Yes. There is a theorem which says strong group form perhaps subjective. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. I, I, I didn't state that explicitly, but um, sort of implicit in this is the, is the following statement that um, if you take the set of x contained in uh, g delta minus g, such that x squared is central, and you take the map to uh, real forms, the map which takes x to int x is surjective onto inner forms in this, in real form, excuse me, real forms in this inner class. Is that the question? And that's a good exercise. Uh, it's, 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 it's an exercise. The, 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 the proof is theta, any theta in this inner class is un, in, uh, conjugation by something composed with um, delta.
and then x is g delta basically. Z2, 
and just take rho on the first factor, and that's what this construction gives. So uh, if you don't want to think about this, just assume that, that rho is a character of h and forget about this. Actually, when you say that's what this construction gives, it gives the, the I mean, the rho you construct here in the easy lemma case would be the character that's uh, ah, the rho genuine one. H and minus one on this. One. That's true. Yeah. Um, that, uh, <coughs> they, um, so what David's saying is that this construction doesn't literally give, it gives rho tensor sign. Yeah, yeah, this is, sorry, I meant to say that H rho is a double cover disk. Um, and so, uh, if rho factor, it, it actually lives to H, let, we just ignore this, and we often do that when we're talking about this stuff, because it's a refraction. And, um, for example, if the group is simply connected, then rho always exponentiates, and you can forget about it. So that's all I'm going to have to say about that. So, uh, um, in keeping with the, the theme of these talks, I'm going to do lots and lots of examples about SL2 because there's lots to be learned there, so let's talk about SL2. So remember, SL2 has two Cartan subgroups. One of them is the circle, and the character group of the circle is the integers. And another one is our cross, and the character group of our cross is Z2 cross C. Uh, and the notation I'm going to use is a pair, epsilon nu, is going to take x to absolute x to the nu, nu is a complex number, or sine x, absolute x to the nu, depending whether epsilon is 1 or minus 1. <coughs> now, the, uh, the whole ballgame... To, to criticize that, one of the things I said is that the way Atlas writes this epsilon is always uh, as a zero or one. Two C. It's a zero or one. Uh, you can yeah. use minus one to the power of zero or one. Uh, yes. I, I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. It'd be, it'd be more consistent if I did that. Yeah. Um, OK, so David talked about this this morning. But as he said, it's really important to get this picture in your mind, in your head. And I had already made this slide before I saw David's talk this morning. And it's worth repeating. So. Um, a real algebraic torus, by definition, you take a, an, a complex torus, which is to say c cross to the n, and you take an anti-holomorphic involution, and you take the fixed points. And um, it's not entirely trivial to see that uh, a real algebraic torus can be written as a direct product of circles, uh, r crosses, and c crosses. Um, think about that, how you would prove that. It's not so easy, but anyway. That's true, and uh, David uh, explained how to parameterize the, the representations of an H. So suppose you have an H with its sigma and theta. The irreducible representations of H are parameterized by these pairs, lambda bar, nu bar, where lambda bar is in this x upper star modulo, the bar indicates that it's a quotient, and nu bar is in this quotient. And I'm writing Q here because I'm only talking about rational, as David was saying, just rational characters. Exactly the same statements would hold if you put C in if you want to talk about complex value theory. Um, now, as Mark asked in a question in the last lecture, um, you might as well assume that nu is contained in this vector space. Uh, just by replacing nu with 1 plus 1 minus theta over 2 times nu, and you can do that because you have these rationals. Um, you can't do that with lambda because you might need a one half to make that work. So, but because I've tensored with Q here, um, you might as well assume nu is in this space, and that's what Atlas always does. The the reason that it's good to write the quotient is, is that when you tell Atlas about a parameter, you don't have to put nu in this minus one eigenspace. You can give it any new, and, and Atlas will do this dividing by two. Right. In, in, in Atlas, if you specify new, the software will immediately replace it with 1 minus theta over 2 times new, which is in this x upper star. <coughs> Excuse me. And these two things are equivalent in this 
portions. Uh, so that's the supplaza. And um, as David said in his talk, um, lambda uh, bar is an element of this quotient, but we're always going to write lambda for a representative. So lambda is just a string of integers or something in X. <coughs> okay. All right, so uh, here's a table of the three different cases. Um, it's similar to the table David had. Uh, the, there are three basic kinds of core. I had a circle, a R cross, or C cross. And for a circle, well, x upper star is z. Theta is the identity. So x upper star modulo 1 minus theta is z. And x upper star upper minus theta is 0. So according to this, the representations of s1 are parameterized by z. And of course, that's the familiar, you're familiar with that. On the other hand, if you put use z, r cross, um, uh, the theta is now minus 1. And so this quotient becomes z mod 2z, and this quotient becomes all of c. I, real, I, just, uh, I realize I'm going back and forth a little bit between q and c. That doesn't really matter. And um, so here's my epsilon and nu, and, uh, as in the previous slide. And then this last example is uh, quite interesting, and I suggest you work it out for yourself. Um, if you take the product of two circles and a swap map, then this, this quotient is isomorphic to z, and this other quotient is isomorphic to c, and you're getting r e to the i theta goes to r to the nu e to the i k theta. And anyway, uh, it's really helpful to work those examples out for yourself to get a feel for how this is done. Questions? All right. Okay, so now we have our group and my fixed Borel and my H and all this stuff that theta and x upper star and x lower star. And uh, I'm going to remind you that Atlas has chosen coordinates so that x upper star and x lower star are both z to the n, and the pairing is the dot product. And we have a specific, we have a fixed, fixed, fixed set of positive roots, and we have the corresponding row. And um, uh, I'm just reminding you that even though rho isn't necessarily a character of t, it is a weight, which is to say it pairs uh, with all co-roots to give an integer. Um, all right, so here finally is the definition of a parameter in Atlas. So a parameter in Atlas is a triple x lambda nu. Uh, I, I feel that... I feel that x lambda nu should practically be added to the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> um, and x is an element of KGB, and lambda is an element of x over star plus rho. Uh, the corresponding lambda bar is the image in this portion. But I'm only, only going to talk about this lambda, which is, in, uh, which is a representative of it. And this plus rho is because of the, the, the rho cover business. And nu is what we've been saying. This is a, a moment of this. And so it's obvious from everything that we've said up till now that this data gives you a character of, well, maybe that's what I said. I forget. Uh, KGB, well, let me follow this slide. KGB is number 0 through n. So just well, not n. n. What, what is it? Huh? N minus 1. Ah! Uh, all right, N minus 1. KGB is number 0. Before I had 1 minus. Anyway. Um, uh, KGB is number 0 through N. And so in, in Atlas, it's just a number. Um, I mean, the KGB elements have lots of properties, but you refer to them just by number. And this lambda is an element of x upper star plus rho. Um, uh, sorry, this is lambda bar. Lambda is in here, and so um, lambda is an element of z to the n, that's this x upper star, plus rho. And as Mark was talking about yesterday, since rho isn't necessarily integral, uh, you can't assume that this is an actual vector, so this, the type of this piece of data is a rat vector. And um, <coughs> new is... Here? Yeah, this is using the... 
I understand. This is the Einstein parentheses convention. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, nu is an element of this rational vector space. We have a basis of it. Um, uh, well, it's actually the minus theta fixed part of it, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, as David was saying, you can give any element of Q to the X. So the data is an integer or a KGB element and two FX. Okay? And so just to, to concretely, um, you need to specify an integer, well, one of these numbers, 0 through n minus 1, and a list of half integers. Um, this is a red vector, but. Huh? Yeah, sure. <laughs> N is, N, is, N is meant as the, you know, it's the royal N. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, this is a rat pack. It, 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 it has the only denominator that it has is two. And then this is an arbitrary rational vector. Okay, so now, um, oh, yeah, so uh, before we go to the next slide, so, um, I didn't say up here, I should have. Uh, it's, it's obvious um, from what I've said up till now that this data gives you a character of a certain real carton. The real carton, this gives you um, theta x, which is an involution of our fixed h. And no ifs, ands, or buts, that's, that's fine. There's, uh, that's absolutely. And and then it's giving you a um, uh, then lambda and nu are giving you a character of the corresponding h r or equivalently an h h over theta module. Um, just by what David said in his talk, applied to, to this fixed carton with this involution on it. Okay. And so the advantage of the atlas point of view is that everything's going on in this fixed carton. We're moving theta around, but lambda and nu are always sort of living in the same place, and, and we're getting a character of this, of this carton. The hard part is how do you translate this into the traditional picture of having some other carton somewhere. Yes? Don't apologize. Yes. And that two parameters the k orbits. Yes. And then when you said that you wanted to fix the inner class, you took not just of the H conjugate but the Latin conjugate. Isn't this using HD to do? Um I, I think I understand the question. 